This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. Today I want to answer the question, was Bitcoin's distribution fair? This is a question that Searching for Truth 4783 has been very patiently asking me in the comment section probably for weeks now, so I'm glad to finally be able to get to it. My philosophy is that everyone gets Bitcoin at the price that they deserve. I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011 when one Bitcoin was trading for approximately a dollar. I was thinking about buying 10,000 Bitcoin at the time, but then I decided that it was just too complicated. I couldn't figure out how to send money to Mt. Gox or wherever, and then it just wouldn't move the dial on my net worth. Unfortunately, today that position is worth about $670 million. So yeah, it actually would have moved my net worth quite a bit if I'd been able to hold on. I didn't end up buying and hodling Bitcoin until 2019. So even with my hedge fund background, or more likely due to my hedge fund background, making me a little bit arrogant and thinking that I understood that Bitcoin was a scam when in fact it wasn't, it took me about eight years to finally figure out Bitcoin and understand it. What's your own Bitcoin story? You probably first heard about Bitcoin three, five, seven years ago, and also like me, did nothing about it for years. So we should ask ourselves, the fact that I came late to Bitcoin or the fact that you came late to Bitcoin, is that Bitcoin's fault? Is that Satoshi's fault? Should he have taken out full page ads in the Wall Street Journal to help us out instead? I don't think so. One of the things about Bitcoin's growth is that it was beautifully slow and organic. It allowed time for the network to grow under the radar. You can contrast this with every other cryptocurrency, which has had a launch complete with a pre-mine and VC investors and lots of hype. For example, these are all the insider token allocations to insiders before the launch. When you see the red or pink here, these are insider allocations to the team, the company, and venture capitalists. This is what we call a pre-mine, which is a distribution of coins ahead of everyone else and it allows them a real advantage because then they can dump on retail investors. As we spoke about a couple days ago, Uniswap had a similar governance token pre-mine where insiders and advisors and investors got 40% of the tokens. This is very common. This happened with Solana as well. And if you watch this video, which I'll link to in the description notes below, you can see the Solana venture capitalists laughing about how they're going to dump their tokens on retail investors. This is not how you launch a neutral and fair new global form of money. Then we have Ethereum, for example. Joe Lubin, one of the co-founders at Ethereum, I'll link to the video, the tape of him saying these words. This is what he told people at the pre-mine. A person can buy from any number of different identities. We may limit the unit size of a sale just to make it easier to disguise. Let's say if you're a whale and you want some privacy and you're planning on investing several several million US dollars worth, then you can do that in multiple entities. We will ask for real world identity in the form of an email address so that we can make sure that everything works smoothly all the way through the process but we won't be requiring it so we can create a pseudonymous email and identity. So this is Joe Lubin basically telling potential whales a sneaky way of getting more Ethereum. And Ethereum did start trading with a price because people exchanged their Bitcoin for Ethereum. I will link to this in the description notes below as well as Joe Lubin in an interview saying he doesn't want to comment on how much ETH he owns. This is not what we're talking about, uh, radical transparency. So I'll link to those two videos. If you enjoy my videos, if you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel by clicking the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment and share this video. So who holds all that ETH? I would say people who bought Ethereum by gaming the system using multiple email accounts are probably large holders of ETH as are Vitalik Buterin, who's already dumped on retail, and Joe Lubin. It's important to know who owns how much ETH because under a proof of stake consensus mechanism, and Ethereum did eventually move to proof of stake a couple years ago, under a proof of stake consensus mechanism, as we've mentioned many times on this channel, owning more coins gives you more control over the network. And this is because owning more coins and staking them allows you to dominate block production and decide which transactions get included in a block. In other words, the richer you are in Ethereum, the more power you have. Does this sound familiar? Because that's basically how the current financial system works. The Federal Reserve with its member banks and Wall Street Bank shareholders. So for example, the New York Fed, which is one of the member banks of the Federal Reserve, Citibank is the largest shareholder, followed by JP Morgan, etc. This is how fiat runs on a proof of stake system. And what's funny is that Ethereum has gone taking this long path basically just to recreate these fiat structures. By contrast, Bitcoin runs on the much fairer proof of work consensus mechanism where owning more coins does not give you additional control over block production or over the protocol. Yes, if you're rich, you can buy lots of Bitcoin mining rigs with your fiat or Bitcoin, but this is quite risky. Bitcoin mining 
is a very low margin, difficult business. People go bankrupt all the time doing it. And even if you were able to do this, this still doesn't give you additional control over the protocol since the Bitcoin nodes spread everywhere around the world. Nodes run by plebs like you and me are always checking your block production, the minor block production work to make sure that the miners are not cheating and violating the consensus rules. By contrast, in Ethereum, no one runs their own nodes. They're just too bulky and difficult to run, but rather everyone outsources them to companies like Infura, which just so happens to be controlled by none other than Ethereum co-founder Joe Lubin. Huge conflicts of interest in Ethereum, which I hope will be explored in a future SEC lawsuit against the Ethereum Foundation and its principles. All the data is out there for them to use. Unlike Ethereum and every other ship coin, Bitcoin did not even have a price for its first 16 months of, of its existence. It started off as a novelty and collectible until the 22nd of May, 2010, when Laszlo paid Jeremy Sturdivant 10,000 Bitcoin for two Papa John's pizzas. So Bitcoin's monetization was organic, it was spontaneous. It wasn't artificially engineered by venture capitalists and marketers and paid influencers who dominate the crypto industry today. Most of their early holders of Bitcoin were cypherpunks, math nerds, and people whose primary interests were not financial. Now, could Satoshi have followed a more equitable distribution path? Here's a thought experiment. Imagine that all Bitcoin was equally distributed at the launch to the global population at the time, 6.9 billion people in 2009. Problem number one, there would be no ongoing issuance or block subsidy of Bitcoin to pay the miners. So for example, at the beginning, miners were being paid 50 Bitcoin per block. And then after 210,000 blocks, you had the halving, they're now paid 25 Bitcoin per block, etc. This is how the new Bitcoin was, was issued. And if you did not have this block subsidy to pay the miners, miners would then be 100% dependent on transaction fees for the revenue in those early days. And that'd be a huge problem for securing a network that no one wanted to use because it was still so new. So the block subsidy was this way of bootstrapping the network and it was very, very clever. Problem number two, nobody values something that they get for free. So if we distributed, if Satoshi had distributed all the Bitcoin globally and equally, you would have a situation most likely where people would not value the Bitcoin and they would lose it. For example, after the fall of the USSR, the Russian people were given free shares in the companies of newly privatized state companies, industrial energy, financial companies, and then the savvy soon to be oligarchs basically snapped up these shares from people who didn't understand what they owned and they were probably happy to exchange them for much needed clothes or groceries. So this is an example of an initially equi equitable distribution that ended up still leading to large concentrations of wealth. I'll link to this Wikipedia article about privatization in Russia and how it played out. Something similar happened in El Salvador as well when all the population was airdropped some free Bitcoin when Bitcoin was made legal tender in El Salvador and most people just lost their Bitcoin or spent it or gave it away. Even if you were smart or lucky enough to accumulate a lot of Bitcoin in the early days, it's unlikely that you were able to hold on to all or most of them. You may have lost some on Mt. Gox or Quadriga or to another scam. You may have actually thrown them out or otherwise lost your private keys as James Howells did who put his private keys on a hard drive or USB drive and it's now in a dump somewhere and he's spending millions of dollars trying to find it. Also many early Bitcoin whales sold their Bitcoin and bought nice houses or paid for medical care like Hal Finney's family uh, he sold some of his Bitcoin to help pay for his very expensive medical care as he was dying. Now, hodling Bitcoin for the long term requires incredible self-control. If you've lived through the last two years in the bear market, you know what this is like. It, it requires incredible self-control and understanding of Bitcoin's underlying value and nerves of steel to handle the volatility, both on the upside and on the downside. And I would say most people simply can't handle it and they end up selling when they have some profits or they end up panicking out. So they end up exiting either due to fear or greed. This is what people think it's like to hodl. This is what it's actually like to hodl. And I've only been hodling since 2019. I can't imagine, uh, it feels like it's been 20 years. I can't imagine hodling since 2009 or 2010 or 2011 and not taking lots of money off the table and buying things with it or just panicking out. 
Now the largest Bitcoin addresses that you'll see often cited, these are all exchange addresses and they're holding Bitcoin for millions of people with accounts at Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, or they're holding Bitcoin for the Bitcoin spot ETF. So here's the top 100 richest Bitcoin addresses. We can see number one is a Binance wallet, number two is a Bitfinex wallet, etc. So a lot of these large Bitcoin addresses are actually holding Bitcoin for lots of smaller investors. Here's another really important thing to remember that Bitcoin is a voluntary system. It's an opt-in system and there is no coercion, unlike fiat money, which is enforced by men with guns and steel cages. If you don't pay your US taxes using US dollars, you're basically being forced to use US dollars. You go to jail. By contrast, Bitcoin is a voluntary system and its distribution was fair at the beginning, if not equal. Because Bitcoin, as we said, started off having zero economic value. So it was initially prized by people. It was prized most by those people who had put in the hard work to understand its construction and its properties. And unlike other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin experienced a slow and spontaneous monetization, free from unethical pre-mines, pre-sales, and pump and dumps. Even today, you can get over a thousand sats or satoshis for just a dollar and most people still don't care. Each Bitcoin is comprised of 100 million Satoshis. You don't need to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin and you can get a thousand sats for just a dollar or a little bit more. These are the same people who don't wanna buy Bitcoin, don't wanna buy a thousand sats for a dollar today. These are the same people who in 10 years when Bitcoin is at $2 million per coin are gonna be telling you and me that we don't deserve our wealth, that we just got lucky, that it's not fair and that the government should redistribute some of our Bitcoin wealth to them. If we take a look at Clark Moody's Bitcoin dashboard, we can see that as I'm recording this, you can currently buy 1,476 Satoshis for a dollar. So we're still quite early. Even after this video, there's still going to be people who say, I don't want to buy Bitcoin because it's not a fair system. Well, I'd say that's fine. It's a voluntary system. They can just keep using fiat money instead. And as Elon Musk retweeted here, these scam coins are getting crazy. Someone just showed me a scam coin that has 27 million in uh, 27 trillion in circulation. I don't think, I think that number is actually lower. It's like 21 or 22 trillion. Unlimited supply cap, only one node, 25% of supply minted in the last six months, 1% of holders own 30%. If you're talking about fair distribution and inequitable distributions, this is talking about the U.S. dollar. So if you're not going to use Bitcoin, which is the fairest and most neutral money in the world, you're going to be forced instead to use a scammy cryptocurrency or a scammy form of fiat like the U.S. dollar, which is obviously not a fair system. Those closest to the money printer benefit from it disproportionately. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.